he had other challenges also. The mutation identified a gene called FMR1, which is actually a gene uh, that interacts with the Fragile X gene that I talked about earlier. So in Fragile X, in about 40% of cases, we see an ASD uh, clinical pre presentation. So this is quite exciting. It's actually the first mutation described in this Capron 1 gene. Uh, we believe it actually is probably the pathogenic mutation because we don't see it in, in any of our control studies. So in this case, the de novo uh, mutation result would help inform to family risk because the likelihood that a second-born child, had we known this beforehand, uh, would carry this uh, de novo mutation returns essentially back to population average. Uh, the gene discovery could lead to a uh, diagnostic marker for earlier identification had we known this beforehand. Um, and the proband here could become a candidate actually for drug trials that are ongoing, uh, in this case for glutamate signaling. Um, there's been investment uh, by a few companies now targeting the Fragile X pathway and um, mGlur5 antagonists, and there's a few proprietary drugs that have been developed seem to be giving quite positive data on the core features of autism in early clinical trials. So this is very, very exciting. I don't have a lot of time to go through this, but there's been a flurry of papers in the last 12 months um, building from gene discoveries, so the MECP2 and Rett syndrome, the Fragile X, uh, uh, sodium channels, um, some uh, metabolic genes that have been identified where perhaps um, dietary alterations may have an impact on, on the development of the child. What happens is you, you model this in mice and then test drugs. Uh, there's been uh, several drugs developed and published in high-impact papers suggesting reversal of the autism phenotype in mouse and in early clinical trials in humans. So this is tremendously exciting. In the second case, the second family, um, we identified rare damaging missense mutations in the X-linked AFF2 gene, and this is FMR2, another uh, fragile X-related gene. Uh, and also um, co-segregating our mutations in a potassium channel gene, KCNQT. And I don't know if you can see this, but the AFF2 mutations are coming from the, the mother, mother and the grandmother. Um, that gene is on the X chromosome, so the female carriers do not express phenotype. Whereas the potassium channel gene is coming from the father. Uh, and he is actually uh, has an Asperger's diagnosis, so he's on the spectrum. So in this case, AFF2 is known as FMR2, as I mentioned. It's a known ASD risk gene. It's maternally inherited. The KCN2 is a potassium channel. And this is involved in um, benign neonatal type 1 epilepsy. And in fact, both the carrier and his father uh, had this type of epilepsy. Um, the mutation detection has implications for genetic counseling for the family and may facilitate, facilitate earlier diagnosis in future born. So, for example, the proband sister shown on the right, she carries both of these mutations, so we think that she's kind of loaded, for lack of a better term, uh, uh, if these are passed on to her male offspring, that he will be uh, at high risk for ASD. Um, the X-linked uh, mutations detected may help to explain the female to male gender bias. And as with the, same, the last case, these uh, new drug trials may become candidates in this type of family if you follow a stratification approach. In the next example, we identify deleterious autosomal inherited mutations in the CHD7 gene in an ASD proband and father. Um, this was quite exciting because uh, mutations in CHG7 are associated with CHARGE syndrome. And in CHARGE syndrome, in 40% of cases, we, we see ASD, we see autism, uh, or 30%, I should say. So um, the proband and father in this case should be assessed for CHARGE syndrome. If you can see the mutations, the father actually has the de novo mutation. It's not inherited from either his parents, and it's passed on. Um, this individual went through one of these uh, odyssey of diagnosis. He went to multiple clinics and, and didn't have a proper diagnosis. Uh, and now with this molecular test, I think this will highlight what clinics he actually needs to go see. And the new, new gene identification, CHG7, provides a new target for drug development. So um, to summarize all of the different types of mutations, we have this model where there are a series of uh, events that happen in the genome, say copy number variants or highly penetrant mutations that affect some of the genes I talked about. And if you have that type of mutation, you will be at very high risk, and it's likely to be the cause of autism. There will be other uh, less uh, penetrant mutations identified, and these will be at a more frequency, a higher frequency in the population, and perhaps you need multiple mutations in these genes. Uh, and as you move towards the right, um, these risk factors have become more common in the population. Okay, so what we're seeing now, if you look at the de novo mutations in the male-female ratio uh, of those highly penetrant um, uh, genes on the left-hand side, they're roughly entering in the 50-50 realm. We need more data, but it's moving in that trend. 
So it looks like these, uh, this, this issue of the threshold that you need to cross depending on the mutation depends on the type of mutation and, of course, your gender. Now, I do have a few more slides. I hope you're not going to kick me off the, slide, off the stage, but five minutes, five minutes. okay, yeah, that's good. Um, uh, we're seeing also that these diagnoses come up in other neuropsychiatric disorders, and I just selected this as an example where we've now identified, uh, and this is also unpublished data, deletions on, on the, at the Geffrin locus on chromosome 14 in autism, uh, epilepsy, and schizophrenia. And this is what we see for many of these different genes that we've identified. Uh, I won't go through all of the specifics, but we've identified the extent of the deletion shown in red uh, uh, um, uh, affecting different exons in the gene, okay? And some of these are inherited, but if they're inherited, the father who is passing on is actually also uh, on the spectrum. Now, this is exciting because like the, the shank genes, the scaffolding genes, uh, Geffrin is also a scaffolding molecule, um, but it's at the postsynaptic density and inhibitory synapses. And uh, it interacts specifically with other genes that are known to be involved in neuropsychiatric disorders, and like the neuroligands, which are implicated in schizophrenia, uh, neuroligand 4 in autism, uh, the A. RHGEF9 gene in epilepsy and intellectual disability, and the GABA receptors, which I mentioned earlier, as targets for ASD treatments in epilepsy and autism. Um, so if you actually map these into a functional network, this is an approach we're using to cluster these genes into uh, groupings uh, using different types of data sets from uh, human pro protein interaction data sets, animal models, etc. You can see that the Geffrin gene, which is the gray dot in, in the middle, links out to all of these different molecules. And the ones that are uh, boxed in red have been implicated in some type of neuropsychiatric and neurodevelopmental outcome. So I would bet my bottom dollar that as we look at more and more patients in multiple cohort studies, probably most of the genes that are identified in this network will, be identi will come up in one or more of these different disorders that we're studying. And I think that as we get more and more data, we'll actually have more specificity in predicting genotype, phenotype outcomes, but we just don't have that yet. The other way to look at this data is perhaps these diseases are not actually uh, um, individual disorders or groups of diseases, they're actually a disease continuum. And I think this is kind of changing the way we think about neuropsychiatric disorders. And the last thing is this issue of uh, gene environment interactions. As we heard in the last talk, G genes and DNA are targets or sensors for environmental effects. Uh, this Geffrin uh, example was really exciting to me. Uh, there was a nice paper published in Brain that sequenced the, the gene, the genomic DNA, and looked for mutations in a bunch of different disorders, and they couldn't find, in particular, this, types of, uh, this type of epilepsy. But when they looked at the RNA, uh, using both uh, RNA from brain biopsies, but also in cell culture-based systems, there was aberrant splicing at the five prime end of the gene in the G domain that's affected in those patients I showed earlier. And in fact, it turns out that uh, they can model in cell-based systems that changes in the environment that are induced by the seizures, so the changes in either temperature, hypoxia, or alkalosis, um, actually lead to the aberrant splicing. So in fact, you might imagine that in some patients, the actual epileptic seizures are affecting the autism risk genes but not at the DNA level, at the RNA level. So this may be one way of thinking about how environment interacts with genetics. So in summary, um, I hope I've shown you that genomic microarrays and whole genome sequencing studies are beginning to unravel the mysteries of autism, providing personalized approaches to medical management. There's really a convergence of data, we heard this this morning, uh, at, synap at synaptic genes. And the big questions in the field, I think, remaining are why are, why are there so many ASD risk genes? So we now estimate there's perhaps two or 300 different uh, autism-related uh, genes. And, and secondly, why do mutations in the same gene lead to such a, a diverse clinical outcome in both autism and neuropsychiatric disorders? And we think the answers will reside in actually doing a lot more sequencing, a lot more genotype, phenotype correlations. And I'll just leave this up during question period, but I would like to acknowledge all of our funders, uh, in particular, uh, Genome Canada and CIHR that have funded our, our very large group for over a decade now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, some questions for Dr. Scherer. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to ask you a, a, a slightly personal question. I'm the only one in my extended uh, family and group of friends who has a background in molecular genetics. And even though I've not studied autism or, or neurological disorders, I find myself the one 
uh, the people in this group ask questions of, and that's because I do have a sibling with an autistic child and several friends with autistic children. And the pace of discovery, as your talk illustrates, has been really breathtaking in the last few years as the tools have improved and the, the analyses have been sort of roaring through the literature. Uh, and what I found is that even though uh, the children are past that initial early stage of early age when diagnosis is most helpful, the parents would still like to know what the underlying cause might be. And so my question to you is, given the pace and given the progress, even though we're still very much at an intermediate level of knowledge, when do you see it becoming uh, uh, more common or appropriate for a family who you know, may have a, a nine-year-old or a 13-year-old where the diagnosis is clear, but still would like to have a better understanding of the under, uh, underlying etiology of disease in their child, when will it be appropriate for them to seek a genetic diagnosis to complement the knowledge they have about the other clinical aspects of the disease that their physicians today are, are telling them? Right, that's a great question. So if you look at the picture on the left, this, this is a, we have a family research day once a year where we invite all of the families. In fact, there's 200 that typically come uh, to Toronto or Hamilton, and most of them are people who have um, adolescents or adults who are autistic individuals now. So because the study's been going on for so long. Uh, and in fact, they're asking those exact questions for many reasons. One, as I showed you, in some cases, having the genetic diagnosis conforms on other medical treatments where there are medicines available. And we have many examples. That chromosome 16 deletion case, in fact, is one of them, where we change the medication for epilepsy and for he has obesity based on the knowledge coming from the genotype-phenotype correlation. There's a nice paper published in Nature on this. Um, but secondly, uh, with respect to genetic counseling. So the first question you, you had to bang on is they want to know why. The second question is what's the, the risk to uh, my family members, including my children uh, and sisters and siblings of having kids. And the third is what can I do to help other people. So in fact, uh, many of these individuals who have been involved in our study who ha are now adults are coming back for that exact reason. Uh, and what's interesting is in some cases now there's a, a real trend for people trying to get stem cell therapy. I don't know what the basis is for, but the companies are, are actually pushing genome sequencing as complementing this approach. Uh, so they're coming in for different reasons, some for, I think, uh, based on a rational um, question, but others to accompany other medications that they're taking. So would you say we're already at a point then where at least referral to a clinical trial or a clinical study uh, to uh, an older child could provide yes. potentially some benefit to that child? Yes. Yeah, so the Ontario Brain Institute in, in Toronto, well, um, we set up a, an Ontario-wide network with many of the people involved to do exactly this type of thing. So we're testing uh, new drugs that are coming uh, in a genotype, in a, you know, based on genomic profiling approach, stratification approach. Great. Thank you. Please. Sorry to monopolize the phone, but um, I'm totally puzzled by how you get a four-to-one ratio, male-female, out of what looks like hundreds of different risk genes across multi-autosomes. So mm -hmm. is there something we don't know about male-female development that, that gives rise to this very prominent bias? Yeah. I that's a great question. So the, the short answer is we don't, we can't explain the, the four to one. If you look at um, uh, apples to apples, if you're looking at equal um, put severity of ASD, it's roughly four or five to one male to female. If you look at um, milder Asperger's, for example, it goes up 15, uh, 15 to one male to female, something like that. So it depends on, on what you're looking at. But uh, it turns out that probably, I think, roughly half the genes that are risk factors will be X-linked genes. So that, um, it didn't come out, so there's been a lot published in the last uh, a year or so doing exome sequencing approaches, uh, and the, the data didn't look at X-linked and autosomal, actually, uh, factors. It only looked at de novo mutations, and part of that has to do with the, the data that comes out of this, these types of studies. The whole genome sequence data, I didn't talk about it, but we get much better representation on the X chromosome, so it's easier to call mm -hmm. the variant. So I think a lot of it will come from the X. The chromosome 19 autosomal story that I talked about in Shank 1 is, I, I think it's the first one I know about. We have another gene called astrotactin 2 
which uh, is, uh, is we see deletions only affecting male. That's autosomal. Um, so you know, we're kind of just starting to get, I think, but, but the, uh, there some of the genetic, common genetic factors that could be involved, um, there's been other theories around about um, selection for um, evolutionary selective pressures for males over females for things like focus and uh, that may play into it, but it's still early days. Ultimately, it's probably going to map back in, in a large part to the X chromosome and to the differences in how the brain develops based on um, um, hormone development. We'll see. Could, could the explanation just be a higher rate of devo de novo mutations in, in spermatozoa than ova? There's a huge, I mean, a big yeah. variation in, 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 in meioses, at least in, in division, cell divisions between ova and spermatozoa. And perhaps you're just seeing the tip of the iceberg because you haven't been sequencing genomes. There might be a lot more very small deletions and other things which went undetected, which by genome sequencing your 10,000 cases, you might mm -hmm. end up seeing that, in fact, there are more de novo mutations in male, and that might, in a way, be, uh, be the explanation. Uh, just a question. Yeah, there, there's a hint at data coming out that advanced paternal age is linked to ASD, as it is in any genetic disorder. but. I, I don't think the data is solid enough to actually draw that conclusion. Uh, it's small sample sizes. And in fact, there's a lot of other selective um, um, selection biases coming from that data set. So for example, um, you could argue that people who are having their, their children later in life actually will have a higher risk of being ASD because of education and things like that. So we have to look at that very seriously. But the technology side, you're, you're right, I, I have a slide I usually show. Um, we're only calling in that data set Indel 65 nucleotides or smaller uh, and single nucleotide variants. This is a, we get all the data in the whole genome sequence, but to actually mine out the structural variants is tough. Uh, and I think a lot of the missing heritability is there. We've got some data to support that. That's the next days. The beauty is once you have the whole genome sequence data at a certain level of coverage, it's somewhat static, and then you just continue to mine it over and over again.